Good morning. Uh, so today is our last lecture on Pinker, and on Monday we'll start with Terence Deacon, The Symbolic Species, and you should start reading that. That's, uh, uh, that's, it's, it's a long, it's a long book, and I'm having you read most of it. Uh, it goes, it, I guess it, it doesn't go quite as quickly as the Pinker. Really, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit more difficult to read then, but it's not it's not really heavy like you know like the purse or something like that. But but you'll need to spend some time with that. On Pinker, we're <coughs> I'm going to close up in working out his theory of the origin of language, and compare his ideas with those of thinkers we've, we've dealt with previously in the course, because he's definitely situating his theories in relationship to these other ideas. First thing I want to do is just to summarize a little bit the basic claim that he's making, that the universal grammar that, he's, that we laid out last time leads him to believe that there's a structure of grammar already in the human mind. And, <coughs> and the human mind basically comes pre-equipped with this structure, uh, basically from birth. And his reasoning, you recall, is that these language structures cannot come from experience because there's not enough input that, the, that babies, children receive from their environment in order to be able to, to, to uh, to deduce all the rules of language. And so from, from that observation that uh, the rules of language can't be coming from this outside input from, from other speakers, he's deducing that these structures must be in children from the very start. So the evidence he's using basically is that, you know, these rules of universal grammar that they've been able to work out that, again, are universal for all human languages and are relatively complex that, that sort of dictate the phrase structure of language and the way in which the different elements fit into that phrase structure. But that complicated as it is, it doesn't seem to be something that's, that's actually learned. It seems to be something that children have from the beginning. The warrant here is, I think, that the complexity in the mind is something that is the basis for learning. So he says here at the end of this phrase, uh, this passage, learning is caused by complexity in the mind. It's not caused by actually learning, by actually experiencing new things, but it's the complexity that's already in the mind um, that allows for the learning. And the, the further warrant, I guess, for this is that this complexity in the mind must have been pre-programmed cannot arise somehow spontaneously, that it, that it must have been somehow genetically coded in the brain. So that's kind of the overall argument. And as part of this argument, uh, this is in uh, chapter five, I guess, but I didn't really have you read I'm just, just going to go over this just briefly, where he relates syntax, which is grammar, to semantics, which is word meanings. Right? So just, uh, I'd like you to remember those two terms. So they're kind of uh, somewhat technical to linguistics, but, but basically syntax is relationships between words, which is grammar, and semantics is, uh, is, is the study of the meanings of words. And what he works out in Chapter 5 is that these word meanings, you know, the meanings of specific words, are names for concepts that we have in our thoughts and these thoughts that we have are basically these, these objects that we, we imagine in our mind actually correspond to the texture of our reality. I mean, he, he, he uses this for the example of, of the rabbit and, and he said, well, you know, if, if, you, if you're walking, if you're, if you're standing there and standing with, with some person whose language you don't speak and a rabbit runs by, and that person says something, then there's a good chance that he said rabbit, right? <laughs> and he says, uh, and the reason is because, well, 
you know, this, you know, he, you know, he could have said something like, you know, I, I don't know, two ears or, or, or uh, I don't know, uh, whatever, uh, two paws or four paws or something like that. But you, you probably think he said rabbit because it was, that's sort of the, the relevant object in the reality. And so what he's indicating is that our thoughts kind of match up to important objects in our reality and, those, and that reality is sort of the basis then ultimately of the, of the words that we have. And there's a kind of, I guess you would have to call it a kind of indexical relationship that's already built into our mind and in our thoughts that links up the meanings of our words with the thoughts in our mind and then from the thoughts in our mind to the objects that are important for our reality. And so basically then, you know, he's got these, these two reasons for why there's this, there's this relationship that, uh, of, of words to our reality. It's because the words correspond to our thoughts and mentalese and that these thoughts then need to, be cor need to correlate with relevant things in the world for them to sort of make sense for us or for, for us to use our, our thoughts and our words effectively. So the, I, I guess, I mean, I, what I'm going to indicate here is the warrant is that the thoughts in mentalese, this sort of language of the mind that is independent of language itself, have by themselves and of themselves a, a close indexical relationship to reality. And that, and that indexical relationship between thoughts and our reality is then the basis of the meanings of words. And so there's a kind of separation then between syntax and semantics, which is to say, you know, he's imagining the way language is constructed as, well, you've got these thoughts that then map onto these words, and these are kind of, an, an, uh, yeah, are in this sort of indexical relationship to reality. And then what language does is it takes these words that have their meanings that link up to reality and links them together through syntax, through a grammar. And so the language module really needs to just contain that grammar, this sort of, these rules by which the words are, need to be linked up. Right, so that's, that's the, the overall schema we have, right, of, of words on the one hand, uh, or, or semantics on the one hand, and then syntax on the other hand, so the, the relationships between words. And if you recall, this is the, the same schema that we have from Hobbes, right? This is, you know, Hobbes s said that, um, the most noble and profitable invention of all others, of all others, that of speech, consisting of names or appellations and their connections. Right. So this is this is you recall this from from early in the course, where Hobbes is also sort of assigning these, these two aspects to language and insisting you've got sort of definition of of names. That's that what goes on first, or th that's kind of the prerequisite for having a connections between these words, and that's the way language is constructed. But you recall also that that's not the only conception we had about the relationship between words and their connections, right? If you recall, Peirce had actually reversed this relationship, right? Where he said, no, it's not the words that come first, the substances that come first, and then their connections. It's actually the connections that come first. And it's by, by means of the connections that we end up with with the words, with the substances. So if you recall, I mean, this is, this, is an, this is the slide that we talked about in which we had this one person that we designated as the murderer. And it's based on that relationship that's embedded in the word murder that we get the connection to the murdered person. And so this, you know, the, the relationship between murderer, murder, murder, and murdered person is actually the same as what we got with Pink here. You recall he talked about a verb has role players, right? Uh, every verb assigns to different nouns a kind of function in the sentence, right? And so with, um, you know, with the example we used uh, last time, we had gave. So gave has these three role players, subject, so, you know, he, the governor, gave, uh, the voters a surprise, so the two role players are this 
direct object, the surprise, and the indirect object, the voters. Here, murder has also role players. It has just two. It has the subject and it has an object, a direct object, so a murderer and a murdered person. And so we have that same kind of relationship where it's actually this, this verb, murder, that's assigning the roles to the nouns. And it's, that's what's setting up the relationships. But what Peirce is indicating, though, is that you don't get that, that you don't get the definition of the murderer until you have the interpretant of murder that, which relates the murderer to the murdered person, which, which is actually kind of accords with what Pinker was saying in terms of this, of the way that the verb functions as the assigner of roles. And if you recall, if you use a different verb, so I guess if, I guess we, if we used a verb on the other side with hero, we, so, so the, the, the hero saves this person, right? Then we've, we've actually got the same person, right? You recall we, we, we were imagining this, this, this police officer who killed the terrorist and preventing the terrorist from killing somebody else. So this, you don't call him a murderer anymore, you can call him a hero. But it's based on putting in a different verb in order to connect that same person into a different set of relationships. Connecting that police officer not to the murdered person, he did murder, so he killed the, the terrorist, but he also saved somebody else who would have been killed by the terrorist. So then you've got a different set of relationships that the verb is setting up. But what's key here is that it's the connections that then define the words, right? So you don't have the words first, and then you set up connections between them. Rather, you set up the connections, and it's the connections that, that kind of define what, what the different words then mean through the relationships that are set up in the grammar, right? So it's a reversal, right? You recall, Peirce is reversing the schema that Hobbes had set up. And Pinker, though, I mean, I guess what we have to say is that in, in laying out his relationship between syntax and semantics, semantics, he's using kind of Hobbes's warrant rather than Peirce's, uh, Peirce's warrant about, the, about that relationship between syntax and semantics, right? That, that he's, he's saying, no, we've got, we, can, we have the semantics first, we have the word meanings first, and then we set up the relationships, and that's what language consists of, if, of setting up this relationship between the words, whereas with Peirce, there's this indication, where there's this, this other way of understanding that relationship between syntax and semantics, where you, you, have, the, you have to set up the connections first, and it's only when you set up connections that you can actually define the words, right? So th this is, I'm just pointing out, as a way of indicating the specificity of what Pinker is doing and then also s kind of preparing you for, uh, for an alternative way of looking at this situation that we're going to get with Dinkin.